believe, in a beautiful violet dress right, right in front of me. Yeah. Now that I'm embarrassed, I'm going to ask you to embarrass me even more. If you can just wave your hands so everyone can see you. And certainly want to uh, recognize the leadership of Don Cash, uh, Dr. Uh, David Goatley, uh, Bill Lucy, and Lamel McMorris. Uh, we certainly want to recognize the leadership of the Special Contribution Fund led by Dr. Dwayne Parker and uh, this extraordinary executive committee uh, of, and, and Freedom Fund Committee of the NAACP led by our president, Madam President Ali. I'm, you have come to the front and people have recognized you once, but let me, let me just say this. In the work of the NAACP, this executive leadership team and the branch president, these are the people who represent stand up, show up leadership in communities all across the country. So Madam President, if it won't embarrass you, I'm gonna ask you and your team to stand once again. And can we recognize them loud enough for Barack and Michelle to do it well? There you go. Reminiscent of earlier journeys. I'm reminded of a journey taken by Native Americans, snatched from their homes, snatched from the hearth, snatched from the things that they knew, the lives that they knew, and forced to walk mile upon mile upon mile of hardship, difficulty, pain, on that which the historians call a trail of tears. And this journey of hardship, difficulty, and travail was a, ultimately a test of character, a test of perseverance, a test of the survivability of Native Americans. I'm reminded of a journey taken by a group of people of Japanese ancestry, taken from heart, taken from home, forced to leave their businesses, forced to leave their ways of life, forced to be transported across the country to desolate corners of our democracy, forced into American-made concentration camps for American citizens of Japanese ancestry. These concentration camps, called euphemistically and politely internment camps, endorsed by the United States Supreme Court in a decision called Korematsu. And this journey of trouble and travail, difficulty in the midst of this American democracy was a test of character, a test of the survivability, a test of a people. I'm reminded of a journey by a group of people kissed by the sun over Africa, who were forced to walk over land hundreds and hundreds of miles, snatched from hearth, snatched from home, loaded into slave ships, the cargo of slave ships, bonded and bound together like human cargo. I'm reminded of a journey taken by a beautiful, brilliant, bright group of people who were enslaved in spite of their obvious dignity as children of God. I'm reminded of a journey in which a group of people were taken across the Atlantic Ocean on a journey called the Middle Passage. But I'm reminded, my brothers and sisters of the NAACP, the journeys are not a matter of antiquity, not merely a matter of history books. I'm reminded that in the midst of this American experience that the greatest band of freedom fighters this world has ever known, that would be the NAACP. I'm reminded that this NAACP, this leadership and membership, looked across the moral landscape of this country, and we came to the ethical and moral conclusion that this is a trying time in our democracy. We surveyed the landscape of this American democracy and came to the conclusion that in this 50th anniversary year of Bloody Sunday, this 50th anniversary year of the Selma to Montgomery March, the 50th anniversary year of, of, of the Voting Rights Act, in the midst of this year, 
We have seen our rights assaulted. We have seen the Voting Rights Act reduced to a shadow of itself. This NAACP considered the Voting Rights Act. But then we also looked into the eyes of our children. A generation coming up in the midst of our democracy who yet feel that they are subject to a generational assault, who yet feel as though they are in the midst of a pandemic of police misconduct. We looked into the eyes of our children who yet have the temerity, who yet have the courage, who yet have the conviction, who yet have the bravery to say black lives matter. And they say that because they well understand that unless black lives matter, all lives can't matter. Unless the first is true, the second can never be true. So this NAACP looked across this country and came to the conclusion we cannot stand in the stillness of the status quo, but we must respond to the challenges of our time. We must give truth to the observation of Shakespeare. Now is the winter of our discontent. And so this NAACP, I mean, looked across the moral landscape, came to the ineluctable and inescapable conclusion that now is the time to march. And so we purpose within our hearts to march from Selma, Alabama to Washington, D.C. To march, yes, from the birthplace of the Voting Rights Act to the seat of our democracy. This NAACP, not merely the board of directors, not merely the special contribution fund, not merely branch presidents, not merely executive committee members, but also our youth and college division, high school students, college students, senior citizens, people from every and all walks of life, from every hue and every heritage, of every race and every color, the rank and file of the NAACP decided that we can't stand still. We cannot accept the status quo. We cannot be complacent amidst this time of challenge, trouble, and tumult. We have to move. We have to march. We have to move forward. And the nation must follow in our wake. So this is the CP. People who look like you, who have the same convictions you have, who have the same values you have, who have the same courage you have, that have the same bravery that you have, and have the same dedication, discipline, and resolve that you have, made up their minds to march from Selma to Washington. And we march under the banner, our lives, our votes, our jobs, and our schools matter. Our lives, our votes, uh, and our jobs, and our schools matter. We march of diverse ethnicities, races, and generations. Seven years old and 70 years old. Nine years old and 94 years old. Eight years old and 84 years old. We march from Selma, from a modest home, the modest home of a woman by the name of Miss Amelia Boynton, who when she died at over 100 years of age, left a legacy of sacrifice and an eloquent example of courage and commitment to the Voting Rights Act. And we march. Yes, Miss Amelia Boynton, we march from her home. A modest home. But a home that really represented a sanctuary of sacrifice, ordained and anointed by the blood of martyrs. We march across byways, historically speaking, that were bloodstained and highways that were anointed with the blood, sweat, and tears of our people. We marched in 104 degree heat, 114 degree heat index, pavement at 109 degrees. We marched because our lives matter. We being painfully 
mindful as this D.C. branch is mindful that we live in the midst of an era of mass incarceration so well described by the legal scholar Michelle Alexander. 2.3 million Americans behind bars. The United States representing 5% of the world's population, 25% of the world's prisoners. We well understand that Americans, one out of every four adults, has a criminal record. 65 million Americans have a criminal record. 100 million Americans have a criminal record or an arrest record. We march because our lives matter. The lives of our children matter. The lives of those with criminal records matter. Those who smoke marijuana and have arrest records matter. We march. We march because we well understand that we've got to do something about reversing and turning back and turning over a new leaf in this country in terms of this era of mass incarceration. We march because we well understand that in the wake and in the ashes and the embers of a post Freddie Gray Baltimore, when there are those in position, those in authority, who yet declare that a whole generation of our young people are in fact thugs. We march. Understanding that you cannot apply the term thug to any child of God, we march, painfully reminded of this little vignette of history. Only a few years ago, a law enforcement officer searching at the bottom of a rusty file cabinet found two photographs, Mark, two sepia tone pictures of yesteryear. Two black and white photographs, pixelated photographs of a time gone by. Two photographs. In one photograph, we saw the picture of a young man with a certain ministerial bearing, a prodigious sense of moral gravitas, a handsome young man. And yet beneath this young man's picture were these numbers, seven, zero, eight, nine. Seven, zero, eight, nine. In the other photograph, there was the picture of a older African-American woman, a woman of mature beauty, possessing a certain kind of reserved demeanor that yet relied a fierce determination. And yet, beneath her photograph, like the grime of graffiti on a wall defacing her undeniable dignity, were these numbers seven zero five three seven zero five three? We don't know the young man by the arrest record number. We don't know the young man by his criminal record number. We don't know the young man by his mugshot number seven zero eight nine. We know him by his formal given name. That would be the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We don't know the somewhat older woman by her arrest record number, her mugshot number, her criminal record number. We know her by the name the school children the world over know her. That is Mrs. Rosa Louise Parks. We cannot allow our children to be defined by their arrest records, by their criminal records, by their mug shots. Every child of God who returns home from prison is in fact a child of God, a returning citizen. They can never be reduced to what they did. They are who they are. So we march. Painfully mindful of the events of Ferguson, Missouri, North Charleston, Staten Island. We march because we well understood that unless we march, that is to say put boots on the ground, to put laws on the books. Unless we march to demonstrate, to ultimately educate, and to ultimately legislate. We march, not because we were seeking physical exercise, but we were endeavoring to educate, inform, and inspire a generation. 
We march in a kind of neo old school way. That is to say, having 43 days of teachings, talking about what does it mean to have a special prosecutor? What does community policing look like? What does racial profiling look like? How do we get behind the In Racial Profiling Act? How do we do something about racial profiling, not only in Washington, but in Washington, D.C.? Not only in Capitol Hill, but in your neighborhood. We march. We march, not only because of the criminal justice challenges before us, but because of the voting rights challenge that threatens our existence as a democracy. We marched because we understood that in 2013, in the Supreme Court decision Shelby versus Holder, the Supreme Court took a wrong turn in our democracy in a wrong, constitutionally wrong-headed decision. That in the wake of that decision, we saw in state capitals all across this country a Machiavellian frenzy of voter disenfranchisement. We saw, for example, in the great state of Texas, laws passed that meant that if you had an ID which allowed you to carry a concealed weapon, it was deemed sufficient civic and democratic proof of identification to vote. But an ID which allows you to carry a book of English, a book of chemistry, a book of engineering, a book of Shakespeare, a college textbook was deemed insufficient civically, insufficient democratically to vote. Over in the state of North Carolina, an ID which allows you to walk across Camp Lejeune, allows you to walk across Fort Jackson, that ID was deemed sufficient proof of identification to vote. But an ID that allows you to walk across the campus of North Carolina a and North Carolina State, Duke University, that ID is deemed insufficient. This war on the vote is a war against African Americans. But not only African Americans, but also our young people. When you deny those who have college IDs, the right to vote, is a war against the young. When you close the Department of Motor Vehicles in Alabama, in counties that are 85% African American, you're not only stealing the vote from African Americans, but you're also hurting rural voters in the black belt. You're also declaring a war on not only the parents and grandparents, but also our children. This is a war on the right to vote. And so we march. We march to pass, to push for the Voting Rights Advancement Act. And we march, reaching 5.4 million people on social media. We march, young and old, because we well understand that in the firmament of our freedoms, in the constellation of our constitutional rights, shines the North Star the right to vote. And we as the NAACP will, will say we will not allow that light to go out. We will not allow that light to dim. We will not allow that light to darken. We will not give up. We will not give in. We will not give over because we understand the right to vote is our right. And we will not allow anyone to take it. We in the NAACP understand profoundly when President Lyndon Baines Johnson sent, signed the Voting Rights Act in 1965, he used 70 ceremonial pens. We understand that the right to vote, the Voting Rights Act, may have been signed into law with the ink of a president's pen, but it was enacted with the blood, sweat, and tears of our people. And so we march. Yes, sir. We march with a certain sense of dedication. Yes, sir. May I remind you that we began this song with a 68-year-old veteran by the name of Middle Passage, his adopted and formal name. A 68-year-old veteran of the Navy, a 60-year-old veteran of the Vietnam War, a veteran who proudly carried the flag and was determined to carry the flag from Selma, Alabama to Washington, D.C. Middle Passage 
Made it 920 miles. You recall, Mark, that our journey was supposed to be 867 miles, but we had to take a little detour as a consequence of a, 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 a welcome party provided for us by the Ku Klux Klan round about Greenville or Spartanburg in South Carolina. And so that journey became 1,002 miles. Middle Passage March, 920 miles carrying the American flag. We arrived in Spotsylvania, Virginia on a rainy, overcast day. And because Middle understood the sacredness of our flag, he wrapped the flag up while it rained. 920 miles into our journey, when the sun came out, he unfurled the flag. And when he unfurled the flag, within a minute, he collapsed and fell to the pavement and he died in Virginia. 920 hardest, most difficult, most heart-wrenching day of my time as CEO of the NAACP was the day I had to call Middle's wife and tell her her husband wasn't coming home. Second most difficult moment of the most difficult day in my brief tenure as CEO was having a grief counselor come to me and pose this question that I pose to you. She said, the young people who saw Middle die asked this question. If a man was willing to die to protect the right to vote, why can't we vote and protect the right to vote? So we are at a moment, as the NAACP, when the entire nation is calling on us to provide grown-up, stand-up, show-up leadership. This is a moment designed and built for the NAACP. This is a moment when those who understand what it means to have a serious policy agenda, who understand what it means to be on an issue, whether the press is there or not, who understand what it means to stick and stay on an issue whether corporate sponsors are there or not, who understand what it is to be with an issue between Freedom Fund dinners, between elections, day in and day out, that's who we are. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's a moment when an entire generation of young people have been in the streets for weeks and months on end. And they say to all of you, to the whole of the NAACP, what a young man, a teenager in Ferguson said to me, tell us what to do. We can't tell them what to do with golden oratory. We can't tell them what to do by lecturing them. We can't tell them what to do by preaching at them. We can tell them what to do by showing them what we've done. We can tell them what to do by pointing to our history, by pointing to our contemporary examples, by showing them the people in this room who support the work of the NAACP and so doing support the work of this democracy. We can tell them what to do by demonstrating day in and day out real leadership. That's who we are. We are in a moment where we have to grow. We have to be one million members strong. We have to expand. We have to welcome young people into our ranks. We have to welcome the best and the brightest in our community and reach out to those who don't yet know that they are in fact the best and the brightest. We as an NAACP have to retool, re-engineer, reimagine the future of this country. We as the NAACP have to expand in terms of membership and leadership and branches all across this country. This is our time. This is our moment. And if by chance you find that you're discouraged in this work, may I remind you of a little hymn of the NAACP. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. 
Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dawn passes toward us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on, 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 till victory is won. It is our time, this is our moment, and you are your place to see that moment. If we could get a warm round of applause for our national president and CEO, Dr. Cornell.